is Headliners and Legends with Matt Lauer. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Headliners and Legends. There's no denying she's got away with a song. Olivia Newton-John has won a truckload of awards and achieved stardom in pop and country music. And it doesn't hurt that along the way she's racked up sales of more than 60 million records worldwide. As if that's not enough, her performance in the movie adaptation of Grease helped to make it a classic. And then her luck seemed to run out. The pop idol with the seemingly picture-perfect life was tested as few people are. How did she come through it? And what was it in her past that made her tough enough to survive? To understand Olivia Newton-John's life, you have to start not with physical, but with physics. Her grandfather is Max Born, a Nobel laureate in physics, and a good friend of Albert Einstein. I remember Einstein coming to our house and playing his violin, and my father accompanied him. I can, I can remember that very well. But with the rise of Adolf Hitler in the 30s, many of Germany's Jewish scientists are targeted by the Nazis. Among them is Max Born, who escapes the tyranny by moving his family to Cambridge, England. There, Born's daughter Irena marries a brilliant young Welsh scholar named Bryn Newton-John. My mother said that what she fell in love with was his voice. He had the most beautiful singing voice. And the first time she ever saw him, he was singing. The Newton-John family grows and flourishes in England. By the time Olivia is born in September 1948, the couple has two older children, and her father is a respected headmaster at Cambridge University. From the beginning, it's clear Olivia has inherited the family love for music. At only about a year old, I noticed that she could sing a note correctly after me, which is quite unusual, I think. And she started to learn folk songs and songs she heard in the radio at a very early age and used to entertain us with them. When Olivia is five, her father accepts a position at a university located halfway around the globe in Melbourne, Australia. It's a world quite unlike the one they left. And it was exciting. I mean, I'd never seen orange trees and lemon trees. And, and I think I was young enough to adapt pretty quickly. I think we all did. Though Olivia and her siblings have no trouble adjusting, the move does strain her parents' marriage. When Olivia is eight, her mother leaves her father, taking Olivia with her. My father was the one that told me, and I still remember that day. I, I was devastated. I think it was the hardest for Olivia because Dad did move away. Olivia's father takes a teaching position in Newcastle, Australia, 500 miles away. Due to expensive airfares and limited family funds, Olivia is only able to see her father once a year. With her mother working full-time and her older siblings now gone from home, it's a lonely time for an eight-year-old. So I was a latchkey kid, basically, and I would come home from school and let myself in, and um, thank goodness there were nice people in the block. There was a lady upstairs with a little baby. Olivia's greatest comfort comes in her friendship with animals. Recognizing this, Olivia's mother arranges for her daughter to take writing lessons. I think she used to love animals more than people. I'm always teasing her about that. Olivia also finds relief from her isolation in music. By age 11, she's written her first song, inspired by the heartache of her parents' divorce. Why, oh why, did you go away from me? It seems like years to me. Why does it have to be? Then at 14, while staring out her bedroom window, a chance encounter changes everything. We used to watch Olivia sitting in the window. She'd just be sitting there all quiet, all by herself, and Denise said to me one day, look, she looks like a really nice girl, why don't we invite her to come out, you know? So we just sort of waved again, and then you went up. And then we didn't know that she could sing, so that was a bonus, wasn't it? Olivia teams up with her new friends, and they form a singing group called The Soul Four. In those days, it was simple. It was, everything was simplicity. You could just go to a club and arrive there and say, we can sing, and they'd say, okay, go up to the stage and sing. Olivia finds a joy in performing that helps her escape her loneliness. And soon, what starts as a fun hobby becomes something much more. In 1964, Olivia's sister Rona enters her as a solo act in a nationally televised talent contest. The first time I remember sitting in the green room and seeing her on camera and just knowing she was going to be a star. I mean, it was just there. The judges are stunned. 
Olivia is hailed as Australian television's biggest find. That virtually was the end of the, of the group, but not as friends, just as the end of the group itself. As part of the contest, Olivia wins a trip to London, but before she has a chance to take it, a better offer comes along, a full-time job on television. But she's only 15, and full-time means quitting school. I didn't really want to go back to school because I was really loved singing and doing what I was doing. She was more or less destined to get into the entertainment business. And so I couldn't see much purpose in her staying in school longer. From variety shows to playing Lovely Livy on a kid's program, it proves to be an invaluable training ground. You had to do sketches, you had to do a music hall, introduce people, do ads. So I had it like a cram course in television very young. Working with an ensemble cast, Olivia learns about romance as well. She performs with her first boyfriend on the show Time for Terry. There was this young guy who was singing there called Ian Turpy, who was as cute as can be. And they ended up like boyfriend and girlfriend for years after that. And it was very sweet. She also becomes close friends with another one of the cast members, Pat Carroll, who will become an instrumental player throughout Olivia's career. I think it was about 64, uh, there was a TV show in Melbourne, Australia called The Go Show, and we immediately became friends. The year passes and Olivia remains in Australia. She sees no reason to leave a boyfriend or TV. But the prize from the contest, the plane tickets to London, are about to expire. And her mother feels Olivia needs a change. She had to really learn and be a proper artist, in my opinion. And so I decided um, I didn't want them to spoil her so much, so I took her away. I didn't want to go to London. My mother kind of forced the issue because I had a boyfriend that she thought I was way too serious about, too young. Coming up, Olivia lands in the center of the psychedelic universe. London in the 60s, where she'll land her first hit. It's 1965, and all roads that are groovy lead to London. Olivia Newton-John has returned to her homeland and is joined by fellow performer and friend Pat Carroll. In the 60s, there is no better place for two teenage girls to be. It was Carnaby Street, and it was Twiggy. I remember reading the Bee Gees at Carnaby Street, and, and the two of us wore false hair, false eyelashes, white lipstick. You know, all the whole fashion thing was great. And she and I slept in the living room floor and my mum had the bedroom. It was tiny. The whole ha flat was as big as this room. Rather than forge separate careers, the girlfriends join forces and create an imaginatively titled duo, Pat and Olivia. So we would rehearse in our apartment. I made the costumes. I did the hems belligerently because I hated sewing. I taught her how to dance. She couldn't dance. The way we dance. She was really focused and I was like, oh, this is fun and I was enjoying it, but I was more interested in getting back to my boyfriend in Australia, but that didn't actually work out because he was going to get married to someone else. When we were young, she never wanted to be a star. She didn't really had no desire at all. I was the one that wanted it and I was the one that, that pushed us, you know. I really wanted to have what I thought was a picket fence, children, you know, dogs, cats, a farm. Do you have it's Pat's determination and contacts that gets them out on the road to fame and fortune. But initially, their journey is somewhat sordid. They were mainly on the road, kind of doing all the dives, traveling around the country. But one of those dives turns out to be a strip joint. Well, we don't know. We, we get hired by our agents to go work at Raymond's. And we walked out on the stage, and the audience is all men. And we're in our little pink tied silk dresses with little roses, miniskirts, doing, you know, September in the rain and all this stuff. There were just these little sleazy men just staring at us. Well, they were waiting for us to take our clothes off. And I don't know what our agent was thinking. We got fired the first night. Their venues soon improve. Within months, they get a chance to perform with the biggest name in London variety shows. Woo! Come on, everybody! Singer Cliff Richards and his band, The Shadows. Back up in the woods among the evergreens. Fame breeds fame, and producers back in Australia want the duo to return. Olivia's old network offers them a TV special of their own. I got a feeling there's a miracle you, gonna come true, come to me. By Australian standards, Olivia has arrived big time. 
The 18-year-old Olivia even sings in her first film. It's Christmas time, down under. But Olivia and Pat know the real action is still in London. So they move back. Then, Pat's visa expires, and their big plans are immediately derailed. They said you have four days to get out. And it was where I had to leave. Olivia is at a crossroads. Does she return to Australia with Pat and continue what looks to be a successful double act? Or does she try to make it on her own in London? The more I see you, the more I want you. Tipping the scales on the side of London is Bruce Welch. He's a member of Cliff Richard's band, and Olivia has fallen in love with him. So that's really why we split up, because of um, boyfriends, I guess. <laughs> love does a lot of things. At the same time, Olivia's agent introduces her to a man who has the power to make Olivia an international star. And the minute I saw her, she just had that charm and warmth and smile that I, I knew would be magic. Rock empresario Don Kirshner, the man responsible for the teen phenomenon The Monkees, is looking to create a new group for a film called Tomorrow. I thought she would be the girl lead, and I, I thought she'd be a superstar. But where are we? She's hired, but Kirshner drops out of the project. Creatively, you know, I felt it was going in the wrong direction. Olivia's high hopes fade with the film's premiere. Anyway, it kind of came out and fizzled. It wasn't a very good film. I'm dreaming my life away. But Cliff Richards eases the disappointment and offers her a regular spot on his weekly television series. Cliff Richard is one of the biggest stars that's ever been in England, I think. My love is real. I did duets with him and did sketches and all kinds of things. When she went on his show, it was a very big deal. Young man in the hot rod car. And as a bonus, the man she stayed in London for, Bruce Welch, is also on the show. By 1967, they're engaged, and Bruce is having an enormous influence on her career. Bruce Welch was very uh, important in, in my early records. Down by the bed. It's his idea that she sing country folk tunes, and when she starts making records, he becomes her producer. With no original material of their own, Olivia and Bruce opt to go for a sure thing by covering a popular Bob Dylan song. If not for you, maybe I'd lay awake all night. If not for you. Olivia records her version of If Not For You in 1971. The song makes the charts in both England and America. Olivia's career takes off. If not for you. When Bruce Welch decides to add a new band member, Olivia suggests John Farrar, an old friend from back home who's also a songwriter. John moves to London with his new bride, who is none other than Olivia's old partner, Pat Carroll. And I was living with Bruce, and John and Pat moved in for a couple of months, so we're all together again. Everywhere I go. As they continue to make music, it's a creative time for Olivia, her fiancé Bruce, and their new music partner, John Farrar. But it's a big adjustment for Olivia's friend and John's wife, Pat. She was in the studio and touring, and my husband was writing her songs, and there was a little pang of, oh, I wish it was me, and that kind of thing. And I felt badly. I'd love everyone to be successful, but I think I did feel a lot of guilt um, for being the one that had everything. After her first release and a taste of success, Olivia spends the next two years looking for a follow-up hit. It comes in 1973 with Let Me Be There. The song goes to number seven on the country charts and earns Olivia her first Grammy Award for Best Country Vocalist. Let me be there in your morning, let me be there in your night. Coming up, as Olivia's singing career soars, her love affair with Bruce Welch falls apart. I love you. Friends are beginning to wonder, who does Olivia honestly love? It's 1974, and Olivia Newton-John is moving away from boyfriend Bruce Welch's musical influence and concentrating more on John Farrar's talents as both a producer and songwriter. 
Well, without him, I don't know if I would have had the career I've had, because um, he writes such beautiful songs. But her next hit is one of the few songs he doesn't write for her. Peter Allen and Jeff Barry do. And oddly enough, she finds it at a flea market. John Farrow and I were sifting through acetates in those days. They were little um, flat discs that they used to send demos on. And it was in this pile of demos. In, and John was living with his wife, Pat, in Potter's Bar. And we are going through and played the song. And went, oh, my God, listen, this song is so amazing. Maybe I'll hang around here a little more than I should. I Honestly Love You is a major hit, skyrocketing to number one in both England and the U.S. I love you. I honestly love you. John and I went from being very poor to really doing quite well within a month. Because at one point we were so broke we couldn't even afford to get our cleaning out of the cleaners. And then her record went to number one and all of a sudden we could have anything we wanted. 1974 is a year filled with a multitude of changes for Olivia. Her relationship with fiancé Bruce Welch undergoes the biggest upheaval. As their career paths diverge and their romance fades, the couple's six-year affair ends. But Olivia's lonely days are few. A new chapter begins on the French Riviera. I broke up with um, Bruce, and you've heard about Rebound? Well, <laughs> I went to France within the same week and met Lee. Lee Kramer has a successful import-export business and thinks he can apply the same business savvy to Olivia's career. Based in London, Lee becomes her manager and new love. But from the beginning, their romance is problematic. Things weren't going so well. My, my love life wasn't doing well. My career was not doing exceptionally well, but it was taking off in America. Her best advice at this time comes from another Australian performer, Helen Reddy. I was doing something in Florida, went to see her show, went backstage and she said to me, if you want to make it in America, you have to be here, you have to be available and you have to be around. She couldn't continue to live in Australia or England and commute. She had to be here and establish a presence and become an American star. And uh, to her credit, she did do that, you know, which took great courage. And so I went back to England, packed up and moved. Moving with her, boyfriend Lee Kramer and Pat and John Farrar. I never thought we could ever have a shot in America. I thought we might have a few hits in England. So America was a real surprise. Olivia buys a ranch in Malibu and can finally indulge her lifelong love for animals. Very exciting. I was able to have horses. I had five horses. I had ten dogs. I had five cats. I rode every day and that was my dream. But an imperfect dream. Her relationship with Lee is proving to be a passionate but difficult one. It's very hard to have a boyfriend who's also managing you. It's too close. It's, it doesn't work. It's too intense. Hi, girls. My personal life at that time Hi, was kind of up and down. My relationship with Lee Kramer was pretty um, a tumultuous kind of relationship, and so it wasn't, wasn't the best time for me emotionally, but my career was doing good. Good doesn't begin to describe Olivia's success in America. The Yanks can't get enough of her. Farrar writes her next hit, have you never been mellow? Have you never been mellow? Have you never tried? Olivia, I want you to know that you've got a whole bunch of friends in our country. Thank you very much, and I'm very grateful to them, Perry, because my success has happened in such a short time. Do Americans always welcome visitors with such open arms? Well, when they... when they look like you do. Smoking cigarettes but in 1975, controversy erupts when the Country Music Association names Olivia as the Female Vocalist of the Year. Oliver Newton-John. Right. A big hello to all of you in the heart of country music, especially tonight. Thank you all very much. That's Olivia Newton-John, videotape from England. Some association members are upset that a non-American is honored with country music's top crown. But the negative feelings fade quickly as Olivia captures almost every other music award that same year. The Grammys. Oh, two Grammys. I honestly love you, Olivia Newton-John. Producer John Farrar. The People's Choice. Olivia Newton-John. And oh. the American Music Awards. I'm just thinking backstage, if she won one more, she's going to have to back a truck up here to load it off. Hollywood takes note of music's new demure diva. And there is talk of putting her in the movies. Coming up, 
Olivia lands a lead in one of the highest grossing movie musicals of all time. And later, a series of crises overshadows her success. Olivia's marriage started falling apart really um, during her illness. Headliners and Legends will return. This is Headliners and Legends with Matt Lauer. In the mid-1970s, Olivia Newton-John's world could hardly seem more secure. Her success and celebrity are growing monthly, and her film career is just about to happen. But over the horizon waits a series of personal challenges that will test Olivia Newton-John in ways few of us can ever imagine. I hurt, but you're on your own now. So am I. I'm living alone now. It's 1977, and Olivia Newton-John's professional partnership with John Farrar is going strong. I think we just had a, a wonderful connection. His songs really work for my voice, and his production is exquisite. But a new John is about to take center stage in her life. It's hard to imagine anyone else in the role of Sandy, but in 1977, when director Alan Carr is casting the film version of the Broadway smash Grease, a sweet-faced Australian is not an obvious choice for a tough-talking American teenager. I met Alan Carr at Helen Reddy and Jeff Walt's house and they invited me, I think knowing that Alan would be there. I always thought Olivia was the perfect person for Greece. Alan Carr told me when he saw her at a dinner party at Helen Reddy's house, he went, oh my God, there's Sandy. She's perfect. So the next day he rewrote the script with Bronte Woodard and made her Australian. <laughs> Olivia's boyfriend and manager, Lee Kramer, is against it. He doesn't like the music. Olivia has doubts, too. She's almost 30 and is worried about passing for 17. I said, this is ridiculous. Then I realized that the whole cast, all of us were in our 20s. There wasn't one teenager in it. Just to be sure she'll fit in, Olivia requests a screen test with newcomer John Travolta. We just clicked as, as people and, and as the characters. And so after that, I said, yeah, I'll do it. I am a true gentleman to Olivia Newton-John. Oh, thank you so much. The first time I met you, you arrived for a reading of Greece. Do you remember that? Yes. 77? I remember was it well. Was it 1977? Awestruck. Because you were already an established star, and I was working my way up. You know, st somewhat established, but I was walking into what I thought of as, you know, very big... Hollywood star. The chemistry between Olivia and John Travolta extends off screen. You know, they'd hold hands and there was flirting. There was a, a sweetness. A, it was absolutely right. It never went further than that. You better shape up. Do, 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 cause I need a man. Do, and my heart is set on you. And the first time Olivia turns up on the set as good girl Sandy gone bad, there's astonishment. Nobody recognized her. She was like strutting around. She did her hair up. And all of a sudden, when they realized it was her, everybody went, oh my God, it's Olivia, you know? So she felt so proud. And it uh, was really hot. Hot and uncomfortable. The only problem was, once she got into those pants, she couldn't get out. They had to sew her in. But they'd stitch me in every day and then cut me out. So I wouldn't drink or eat much. I couldn't for those days when we were filming because I didn't have to go through the whole rigmarole. You know? When Grease premieres in 1978, there are mob scenes. At the Chicago opening, Olivia suffers bruised ribs when a frenzied crowd nearly pushes her through the glass doors of the movie theater. It was nuts. It was really nuts. It was exciting, but it was a little scary. Grease becomes the highest grossing musical of all time. It not only makes her an international star, it gives her back something she missed from her own teenage years. I've always said that Greece was the, the, the school fun that I never had. John Farrar writes two new songs for the film. You're the one that I want and... It's mine, it's not the first. Hopelessly devoted to you. Both are top ten hits. While the Olivia and John Farrar partnership is in full gear, her relationship with her boyfriend, Lee, is losing steam. The following year, she stars in another musical, Xanadu. It gives her another number one hit. But it 
doesn't create the same box office heat she had with Greece. It does, however, provide her with two new terrific dance partners, Gene Kelly and a young actor named Matt Latanzi. They didn't have a leading man for Xanadu yet, and um, so they put me with this young dancer who was going to be my partner. And um, that was Matt Latanzi. Her relationship with Lee Kramer is ending. Olivia begins to date Matt. Although she's 31 and he's 20, for her, he's perfect. And Olivia falls hard. And he was very sweet, very lovely young person and was just, had just arrived from Portland into Los Angeles and was kind of an innocent kind of uh, young man and um, had a kind of had my childhood with him I think he was my the childhood that I hadn't had you know camping and hiking and fishing and all the kind of things I hadn't had time for because I'd been I had a career but there's not much time to relax Olivia continues to tour and record the thoughtful love songs she's known for But in 1981, she moves in a new direction and scores the biggest hit of her career, the sexually charged Let's Get Physical. It's a risky move in the still tame early 80s. Olivia is worried that the suggestive lyrics might damage her career. After I recorded it, I remember calling my manager at the time, Roger Davies, and I said, Roger, I'm freaking out about this song. I think I've gone too far this time. And my manager, Roger Davies, who was her manager, said, yeah, don't be surprised if this actually doesn't get on the album because it's just so risque and Olivia doesn't want it to be the single because it's too embarrassing. But the wizards in marketing have an idea. The MTV era has arrived, so they turn physical from a song about sex to one celebrating fitness. It just happened to be at a time when people were really into getting fit anyway. They were definitely naughty words. My husband's very naughty. <laughs> Um, but uh, they, they played with the video so well that I don't think many people really, well, they got it, but they didn't. Physical is an instant aerobics anthem and will become the top-selling song of the 80s. For Olivia, the decade seems full of promise. She can't imagine what more the future will bring. Coming up, Olivia's life is shattered by a young child's death. <laughs> We all sort of kept believing that this, this isn't going to happen. With her 1981 album, Olivia Newton-John heats up the charts. She also heats up the passion in her personal life with boyfriend Matt Latanzi and the passion for causes close to her heart. Olivia writes the song, The Promise, when she learns that dolphins are being needlessly killed in tuna nets. If I can only make one man aware, one person cares. I remember her very agitated and adamant about it. Olivia follows her words with actions and boycotts touring Japan until they amend tuna fishing policies. It wasn't always common that a celebrity of her stature would take that opportunity to speak out about an issue that she knew would maybe offend the Japanese economy. In the United States, Olivia continues to be America's sweetheart. And to make sure she knows that, Hollywood gives her a star on their walk of fame. You get the feeling that we love you more in America than they do there, huh? <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. We love you here. Do we deserve a Two years after Let's Get Physical, she teams up one more time with John Travolta for the film Two of a Kind. Love is what we Ever since Greece, Olivia and John have remained friends and have talked about working together again. Finally, John rings me one night and he says, I just read a script, and if you don't like this one, I don't think we're going to ever make a film together. So. What I love is about this for you is, mm -hmm. is, is it really gives you a chance to act and it demonstrates your ability as an actress. 
Like Xanadu, the movie Two of a Kind fades quickly. But its theme song... It's gotta be a strange twist of fate. Twist of Fate is another hit for Olivia. In real life, her partner is Matt Latanzi. She's more in love than ever, which shows when they make videos together. And in December 1984, five years after meeting him, in a private ceremony at home, Olivia and Matt marry. She's 36, he's 25. The best experience in my life came out of that union. That was the birth of our daughter, Chloe. It's an experience Olivia is able to share with her best friend, Nancy Chuda. And we gave birth to our daughters within four weeks of each other. We planned that. I got pregnant and I called her up and I said, no! <laughs> Chloe Rose Latanzi is born on January 17th, 1986. Her birth changes Olivia's life forever. Well, I think I found what's important in life, and I think what's important in life is your family and children. You're the dream. records an album of lullabies, writing the title track Warm and Tender for Chloe, who graces the album cover with Nancy's daughter, Colette. The key to the Warm and Tender album is somebody has to kiss Olivia. So Chloe looks away and pouts, I'm not gonna do it. I don't know why. I was probably really moody that day and I was like, no. And I like, I, I remember Colette actually kissed my mom and I was stroking the back of her hair. Colette kissed Olivia and to this day, I'm so glad she kissed Olivia. For Olivia, it's no longer about career. This time is about two little girls. Like their mothers, they're inseparable. We'd hike with those girls, we'd canoe with the girls. We'd go camping with the girls, I and mean, we did everything with them. But then the unthinkable happens. Nancy's daughter Colette, at age four, is diagnosed with Wilms tumor, a form of kidney cancer. We all sort of kept believing that this, this isn't going to happen, you know, that she's going to survive this. And she did survive for nine months, and she died. Even through being sick, she was so happy and smiled all the time and never complained. And I just, I really miss her a lot. And I just always wonder what it would be like if she was my age and playing around. It was like losing my own child because we'd been so close. We'd raised these babies together. This was Chloe's best friend. That was a life-changing experience for everybody. Still reeling from Colette's death, the following year, Olivia begins to have health problems of her own. I wasn't feeling very well, hadn't been feeling well for a while. Concerned about a lump in her breast, she has a needle biopsy. And I had this really strange feeling when I was lying there. I said, I know that this is something, there's something really wrong. Compounding her fears, she gets word that her own father has cancer. I did a biopsy. Then I left for Australia right after the operation because my father was really, really ill. And I never told him what was going on. By 1992, all the good fortune that has appeared to come so effortlessly to Olivia seems to be reversing itself. And as more problems arise, Olivia, her family and friends will be tested almost beyond the limit. She came running home from school and said, Mommy, Mommy, um, the kid at school said you have breast cancer and you don't, do you? And I thought, oh, I have to tell her now. This is Headliners and Legends with Matt Lauer. By 1992, Olivia Newton-John has been a force in the music business for more than 20 years. After taking a brief hiatus from singing to raise her daughter Chloe, Olivia prepares to go back on tour. But she's not feeling well and is anxiously awaiting the results of her own medical tests. Sometimes our greatest fears are what we create and what happened to us. And I had been afraid of cancer in my life. The news isn't good. On July 3rd, 1992, Olivia is diagnosed with breast cancer. And on the same day, her father dies of lung cancer. So he died and I, he never had to know about me, which is probably very good. He, I went to see him, told him I would come back and see him, you know, in a couple of months. And he died about a week later on July 3rd. After burying her father, Olivia now has to concentrate on her own battle, 
She cancels a scheduled tour, undergoes a mastectomy, has reconstructive surgery, and begins chemotherapy. I remember going in there for my first treatment thinking, this could be it, we're going to put that in, I'm going to be allergic to the poison, I'm gone. When I actually walked out of there and I was alive and Nancy said, let's go to the movies, and I went to the movies and I took this drink they'd given me to stop the nausea, I thought, my God, I'm going to actually be okay, I'm going to make this, it's okay, I lived, you know. After eight months of chemotherapy, Olivia is finally on the road to recovery. With her family in tow, she goes to their farm in Australia. For years, it has been her sanctuary. Her husband, Matt, expresses optimism in public. Livy right now is back on the farm. She's actually feeling great, and she's um, totally recovered. And she, um, right now, she's enjoying herself. She's, uh, uh, I think she's probably planting something right now. But in private, the marriage is in trouble. Olivia's marriage started falling apart, really, um, during her illness. Any major shake-up like that in a marriage makes everybody examine their feelings and where they want to be. Well, on her farm, she writes her most personal songs to date. Gaia, One Woman's Journey, a reflection of her own life's lessons. I'm not going to give in to it was written on one of those dark nights after chemotherapy when I wasn't feeling very good and that's kind of become in my show a song that everyone responds to because no matter what you're going through whether it's a, an emotional problem or a physical problem we all need to we just can't give into it though she and Matt have grown apart to Olivia even thinking about divorce reopens childhood wounds for Olivia it was so hurtful and disheartening because she never really wanted to have to experience or have Chloe have to experience what she had undergone. I really didn't want her to go through a divorce experience and that's why I waited until the last minute I thought, damn if I wait long enough it'll be okay. But it's not. In 1995 Olivia and Matt separate and then divorce. However they agree to do all they can to ease the pain for Chloe and change the experience from what Olivia had to endure when her parents divorced. Chloe never had to not see her dad and, and we always we always were civilized with each other and I think that's really important, extremely important and um, now we're even friends. No matter what you do, I you lie. No Out of it all, the illness, the personal loss, Olivia searches for the positive and looks for ways to help others face their own challenges. She becomes the national spokesperson for CHEC, the Children's Health and Environmental Coalition. Olivia joins Nancy and Jim Chuda, who founded the group in memory of their beloved daughter, Colette. CHEC can happen. We can make it happen, but we're going to need your help. One at a perfect time, say, write a check for CHEC. As Olivia approaches her next decade, she experiences a rebirth of sorts. At age 50, she once again thrills her fans when Greece is re-released. And with newfound confidence, Olivia tours for the first time in 16 years. I didn't used to enjoy performing on stage because I was so afraid of messing up that it was a terrifying ordeal for me. But now I'm actually enjoying it. And I think after what I've been through in the last 10 years, I'm like, hey, it's okay. I can just relax and be me. If you like them, pay it up, pay it up, then you ought to be glad. And so it seems like the perfect time for Olivia to start leading a freer oh, hell yeah. maybe even more wild life. She's featured in an independent film, Sorted Lives. She plays a Texas, yeah, butterfly. She she sings in these, you know, these Texas little dreadful <laughs> little dives. Now who's to judge? Who's a saint and who's a sinner? It's a comedy about naughty little secrets in a small Texas town. See you boys in the funny papers. Right. I was kind of nervous, and I've got to say a couple of swear words, which I've never done on public, even though not the worst words, but they're, you know. Ain't it a bitch? We made this for no money. Olivia made like $800 to do the movie. Which doesn't leave much room for star treatment. And that suits Olivia just fine. She did her own makeup. She cut her hair herself, just got the scissors out and cut it. It's time. It's time to tarnish the image, I think. And while she continues to expand her world, 
the center of her universe remains her daughter, Chloe, who is starting a career of her own. I think that she's extremely talented, and, and all my friends will tell you that I'm pretty realistic about those things. If fame does come Chloe's way, she can learn a lot from her mother about handling that fame with modesty. Maybe it's also never quite believing I was good enough, and I think that maybe it's very healthy. And um, I, Australia definitely has a big role in that, and it's a very grounded country, and they'll knock you down flat if you act big time. She has been a star for more than a quarter of a century. And in spite of all she's endured, Olivia has remained the easygoing, down-to-earth girl next door. The thing about Olivia is that she's not changed at all. I mean, the only thing that she's done is she's just matured into a more beautiful woman. She means it, you know, from the bottom of her heart. She just wants to help everybody. She's just a great all-round person who knows that to be happy, you've got to be happy with yourself, not the image of who you are. Once you are a friend of Olivia's, you're, you're always a friend. She'd never let you down. Maybe I hang around here a little more than I should. My dreams, I, I feel like I fulfilled most of them, and so every day is kind of just like icing on the cake now. My dreams are probably for my daughter's happiness and health, and whatever that direction that brings her. For me, um, health um, and just more of the of the peace that I'm finding, I think, it would be perfect. I honestly love you. These days, Olivia Newton-John plays to crowds of true believers who fall somewhere between Generation Xers and Baby Boomers. She's older, perhaps more reflective, but that hasn't diminished her enthusiasm on stage or her ability to move audiences when she speaks out on the topic of breast cancer. I'm Matt Lauer. Thanks for watching.